One, 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 one shot, now the future is yours, go! I'm turning dreams into reality In the lab with the formula and chemistry Your memories spark and motivate And make the industry shake We put the bars in the place I'm talking one One chance at best, yes Painting pictures for the culture Keep the pressures fresh Yeah It's one all on one shot Now the future is yours, go! Welcome to our eighth episode of Smash Life Spotlight My name is Justin Lamb I'm the founder of Smash Life I am so excited to introduce our next guest. I've known her for a really long time. And if you've been watching indoor volleyball in the Olympics, you know who she is. She is the youngest player to ever earn her AAA rating on the beach. She helped her junior volleyball club win a national title. She won an NCAA championship with Nebraska and recently won the gold medal in the Tokyo Olympics. She is the libero on the women's national volleyball team. Please welcome Justine Wong Orantes. <laughs> Justine, thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, uh, before we kind of dig into our interview, I generally like to ask uh, that you, if you can do a quick introduction about yourself, you know, where you grew up, your upbringing, um, just a little bit more about you. Okay, yeah. Um, so... Um, I grew up in a pretty well-known volleyball family, as you know, and a lot of the nine-man um, community knows my mom and my dad both played volleyball at some capacity, and, and um, they continue to ref volleyball. My dad also coaches volleyball at the club level, and my younger brother, Anthony, plays volleyball um, uh, in club and then went on and played a little bit in college, so I would say we're definitely a volleyball, you know, bred family. And um, I've enjoyed, you know, kind of my journey from my younger age until now. Um, I grew up in Southern California and went to Los Alamitos High School and um, was a setter all throughout the high school and club levels. I transitioned into the libero position um, my senior year of high school full time and um that's when I, you know, just, it was kind of like a fairy tale story. They had, uh, Nebraska had seen me play libero uh, for one match in my club season. And it just so happened that they needed a, a libero for that incoming class for 2013. And so it worked out really, really well and still like beyond thankful for that experience. So went on to play libero four years at Nebraska and was um, just fortunate enough to be surrounded but with some great players. So we won a national championship and a Big Ten championship. And then, um, you know, I was after college, I was still wanting to play more. So um, my options were, you know, to go into the professional life. And Karch Karai, the head coach of the women's national team, had invited me to come out to the national team gym in Anaheim, California. And so um, 2017 was my first season with the national team. Awesome. Well, thank you for the introduction. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to dig into kind of your volleyball career. And, and you know, when, when we kind of step back and from the beginning, I know that you said, you know, your family is a volleyball family. Um, what what really sparked your interest about the sport? I know that you probably grew up around the gym, uh, you know, with your parents playing. Um, but, you know, what really sparked your interest about volleyball? Yeah, I mean, I love the fact that it's just community based and and you see different types of community, whether it's, you know, just league volleyball, it's club volleyball, you have nine man volleyball, there's just always going to be a sense of community. And I think that's what really draws me to the sport um, is having those people just surrounded and really, you know, also sharing that same passion of volleyball together. And like, for instance, club volleyball, like I've played for the same club. I played for Missouri Long Beach for 10 years. And so I really grew relationships with my teammates. And um, to this day, like I am still very much in contact with them. And I, I think it, it speaks volumes because of the sport that, you know, brings us together and, and really just creates a lot of long lasting friendships. And I think that's what really drew me to the sport initially. Absolutely. Yeah, I think volleyball is a very tight-knit community and, 
and, and being able to play with your friends and also for other outsiders to play the sport, you know, even at a recreational level, it's just like a very common sport that everyone likes to play. Whether you're on the beach, you're like, hey, let's bring a volleyball. And people that right. maybe have never touched the volleyball can can enjoy the sport too. That's what I really love about it. Um, and, you know, talking about beach volleyball, um, I know that you started pretty early on in your in your life. Uh, you were the youngest player to ever earn your AAA rating on the beach. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about that experience. Like, how did you start going to the beach? Um, I know you had a, a great coach, a great teammate, but, you know, tell me about a little bit about your journey as you started to play beach volleyball and how you earned your AAA rating. Yeah. So it really just started off with um, our beach coach, Bill Lovelace. He was actually um, connections with my mom um, with real estate. And so we had we were living in a, um, an apartment that he actually had owned. And so that was kind of the connection there. And then he was like, well, like I have this really great player, Sarah Hughes, like I know her and her family really well. And so that was like the initial connection between Sarah Hughes and I, who were still really great friends to this day. And we played a lot of beach volleyball growing up, but um, he had invited us to come to Huntington Beach one day. Um, we typically practice Tuesday and Thursdays of every week. And so I had no idea what to expect. And I'm just thinking it was just going to be Sarah and I, but there was actually a group of people that he had invited out to the beach and um, it was pretty uh, structured. He had his plan. He had his um, kids that he really liked being there. And so we kind of made it a, an annual thing, an annual summer thing where every Tuesday, Thursday, we're going out to Huntington. We practiced around nine to 12. And it was just, you know, different ball control drills for about the first half of the practice. And then we would play a lot towards the end. And it was just so fun because, you know, who, who doesn't love going to the beach and hanging out with their friends. And then on top of that, like we would stay there for hours after practice and just kind of hang out, go to the water, get Jamba juice. And so I really just, you know, looked forward to going to the summer and, and training um, with Bill and everyone else. And um, we probably did that from around eight years old and then up until the high school um, age range. And then once I kind of got really, really serious about indoor volleyball, that's when I kind of flipped the switch. And um, I focused more to indoor, especially when I had an offer for a full ride to Nebraska. That was kind of my focus was leaning towards that. But yeah, I, I miss those summers and going to Huntington all the time brings back such good memories. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And I, I remember you know, seeing, seeing you on the beach and, and how much fun you had, you know, growing up and, um, you know, what were some of the things that uh, you worked on as a play, as a young player on the beach? You know, I think that there's a lot of fans out there that had questions about how to improve their game. You know, what were some of the things that were really important um, being a young player and on the beach, you know, beach is a very different game from indoors, but what, what were some of the, the key you know, skills that you learned uh, while developing on the beach? Yeah, I mean, Bill did a really good job of focusing on those fundamentals and really exploiting like all of the skills that we had to learn. I mean, you know, beach volleyball is a game of two players and so everyone has to be well-rounded. So we worked on a lot of uh, just bump setting and we did this uh, drill called triple bump where you could only use underhand um, platform and you would have to score with that. So whether you go one, two, three contacts, but we loved that drill. Like we always look forward to playing that. Uh, and sometimes it would be tricky because we would have that wind element on the beach that you don't get in indoors. And so that taught us a lot, you know, how to use the wind and um, you know, what, which side was good and bad side. He would always teach us to pick up the sand, go towards the water and pick up the sand and see which way that sand was blowing. And that could tell you a lot about which side was the better side and so um yeah he had all of these drills that just really focused on ball control and you know uh, we're doing some balls where you had to only have two contacts so you had to play it over on the second um touch so that also focused a lot on on that ball control element and I feel like honestly like 
that has probably just really put me in place for my career now because without a lot of those touches that I had on the beach, I don't think I would have been as prepared as I am for, you know, when I was at Nebraska and even now with the national team. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and tell me a little bit more about Sarah Hughes. I know she is on the AVP now, um, but, you know, you guys have built a friendship from the very, from basically the start of playing beach volleyball. Um, you know, you guys have built a friendship and have played a lot of tournaments and won a lot of adult tournaments. But, you know, tell me a little bit about that experience, knowing that your friend is now playing professionally on the beach while you're playing professionally indoors uh, to see that success and how it all kind of start started from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am so beyond excited for her and her career right now. And um, I think what made our, I guess, friendship and relationship so special was that we had such, we shared the same amount of passion for volleyball, whether it was indoor or beach. We were just always wanting to be in the gym. And it was always, um, it was lucky for us because we were always on the same team, whether it was on the beach playing doubles or we actually played for the same Mizuno Long Beach Club um, indoors. So we we started when we were 12 all the way through 17s. Um, and so we just had this special connection and we really um, gravitated towards you each other because we wanted to always be in the gym getting better. And um, I really admire her work ethic even to this day. And I, I know she's going to go far and um, I'm just so excited for hopefully in three years for Paris so we can both be out there together. That would be, that would be so fun. (laughs) That would be amazing. Um, Yeah, I definitely hope that she's able to achieve that success and and similar to you, you know, continue uh, to achieve all the goals that you're achieving today and definitely want to see you guys both in Paris, uh, you know, pushing for gold. Um, you know, now the little talking a little about more about indoor, you know, you end up transitioning to indoor. Um, and like you mentioned, you were a setter in high school for probably majority of the time. Um, and then you end up switching positions. What is it? Was it your senior year in high school or did was it only like a club season that you ended up switching only- to the libero? Yeah, only my club season. Um, For high school, I still set. And then, yeah, for club, that was my like full transition to the libero position. Wow, that's so it's not even like a full season. It was basically just a club season that you had. Mm -hmm. And and so what was that conversation like with yourself? I mean, you know, I, I assume that, you know, you were probably getting looked at at the setter position, but maybe some schools that you may or may not wanted to go to or wanted to go at a higher level like what was that decision like um and conversation like with yourself to make that decision to switch to the libero position yeah honestly I felt like in the back of my mind um going through the recruiting process I knew I probably had to switch positions Mm -hmm. um because my dream my dream school was to go to Stanford um as a little girl and so um I was if I wanted to achieve that dream I probably knew in the back of my mind that I needed to switch but the initial spark was when my club coach actually switched um me um during during JO's my junior year, that was the one and only time that I had first played libero. And so he kind of, I guess, yeah, flipped a switch in my mind saying, oh, okay, maybe I can actually do this. And so um, when Nebraska came in the picture my junior year, um, we set up an official visit my senior year. And I was like, okay, well, now that they have, have seen me, I need to fully commit myself to the libero position. And so my club season, that's, you know, what I focused on, what I um, worked towards. And so um, that, you know, initial mindset was a little harder for me only because I grew up setting the entire um, way. And so I guess that kind of the leadership and just the, the mental, uh, the mindset just kind of switches from being a setter to a libero because as a setter, you're kind of running the show and just, you have a different, I guess, ability to lead the team. And so my first couple of years at Nebraska, it kind of took me a while because I was adjusting to a new position and kind of trying to figure out ways to lead in a different way than I led when I was a setter. And so Mm -hmm. 
as soon as I kind of got comfortable in that position, I think it, it was probably around my junior year was when I was like, okay, like I'm more comfortable. I'm kind of getting used to, you know, all of the different teams in the big 10 um, because the big 10 was definitely very tough. And so mm-hmm. um, kind of going against every team, you had to play your best. And so um, as soon as I kind of, you know, owned my space as a libero spot, that's when I um, fully, I guess, embraced that role. Absolutely. And I think, I think you hit it on the head in terms of just like the different types of leadership that you provide based on the position. Right. And, you know, talking to young setters that are listening to this interview right now, or when we post it, you know, what is some, what are some of the, what is some advice that you can give them, you know, for some of the young setters that you learned over your time as a setter and how they can lead their team? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is just, how you carry your team with your body language. And I think that kind of makes or breaks a team is, you know, how the team can rally up together. And I think, you know, not going too far forward, but when we were in the Olympics, we had such a tight knit group, whether you were starting or you were on the bench, like we all felt the support from one another and could kind of lean up against each other. And I think that's, Um, would be my advice to young players um, is just, you know, you have to be able to be a good teammate and that's what's going to propel you forward in your career. Um, And so as a setter, like everyone is looking to you because you're essentially the quarterback of the team. And so, um, you know, everyone kind of leads in their own way. Um, So I would say, you know, as, as you get older, you, you'll figure that out as time goes, but yeah, um, body language and team chemistry is just a huge thing as, as being a part of a team. Absolutely. And, and even thinking about uh, the libero position, you know, I think that when I think of the libero position, it's almost like you're quarterbacking that back row, right. When it comes to serve, receive and things like that. So what were some of the differences in terms of that transition being a setter touching the ball, almost every single, every single play, right. Cause you're the quarterback of the team to now being a leader in like, a. I guess certain um, situations, right? Whether it's defense or or serve receive, you know, what were some of the different transitions that you had to make in terms of a leadership role uh, when moving to a libero position? Yeah, I mean. I think the main thing that I learned was probably just using my voice and how I can really direct traffic in the backcourt. And maybe Mm -hmm. it's, you know, helping a a passer out, maybe it's helping the front row outside a little bit so that they can have, you know, less stress on themselves. They can focus on attacking. And I think that's just little ways of just elevating people's play on the court. Mm -hmm. And it really does help, you know, by helping each other, that's obviously going to help elevate the team's, um, performance on the court. And so that as soon as I kind of understood how I can lead in that way, that's when I found myself helping others. And then also like, it takes off a lot of, um, stress off of me because for me, like when I am thinking too much about myself and how my play is and kind of like dissecting every play that I do, that's kind of when I start to spiral down. So as soon as I can look outwards towards other people on my team, that's when I'm like a little bit more free and loose. Absolutely. I love, I love that. Um, and I agree, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's ultimate team sport, right. And it's, it's mm-hmm. helping each other, uh, you know, with their positions and how they can do it better. And if that means taking on a little bit more and, and easing uh, some of the, not, I wouldn't say stress, but some of the responsibility when it comes to maybe like serve receiver, things like that, then you, then you allow them to kind of transition faster things like that, mm-hmm. that, um, you know, as, as hitters can appreciate uh, yeah. when a libero can step in a little bit more. Um, yeah. Definitely. Um, and, and talking about Nebraska, you know, you just, side you you get a full scholarship offer from Nebraska through that um you know that club season where they saw you play libero tell me a little bit about the that recruiting process um you know you you did make a trip out there what really stood out to you about Nebraska as you were on that recruiting trip yeah yeah so my recruiting process overall was pretty short because as soon as we set up an offer or an official visit, it was my senior year. So by that time, like typically in this day and age, it's pretty late to commit to a, um, to a school. And so um, I had set up an official visit and then I went out and, you know, saw 
the whole facility. I even got to go to a football game, which was pretty awesome. Um, saw a volleyball game. And um, I think just the overall support that Nebraska gives to their athletes, whether it's academically or it's life skills or it's on the court. Yeah, every every single aspect of not Nebraska athletics is pretty, you know, unbelievable. So I felt like I was truly at home because I think, you know, growing up into a volleyball family, um, Nebraska is pretty sports centered, whether it's volleyball, football, you know, you name it, they, they don't have their professional sports. So they gravitate towards uh, Nebraska athletics. So I felt pretty, you know, at home when I got to um, that visit. And then maybe one or two weeks later, I called up um, John Cook and I had told them that I wanted to be a Husker. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I watch those games and it's, it's pretty incredible. Like the when you see a Nebraska volleyball game, and if you haven't, uh, definitely check them out. It's the crowd is really into it. It's really fun um, to see that type of atmosphere. Um, and I know yeah, Nebraska doesn't really have a professional team. So it's really fun to see that atmosphere, especially in a volleyball uh, match that you just don't normally get to see. And uh, I'm sure that has kind of prepared you for, you know, professionally and um, and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of, you know, as as you started to get towards the end of your NCAA career, you know, you end up winning a national championship, which was really fun to watch. Um, and you start talking about, you know, what's next, right? Um, and when Karch Karai um, calls you up to go train with the national team, you know, what, as, as you started to go through that transition, what, what kind of differences did you see between the NCAA versus international play? Yeah, um, I just think that from going NCAA to professional is – it's a whole different ball game in the sense that, you know, every single player, whether, no matter what your position is, are, are very well-rounded. There's less substitutions in the game. And so it forces every single um, position to be able to do all the skills um, mm. as opposed to, at, you know, in, in college, you get, I believe, 18 substitutions. So there's, you know, a lot of DSs typically on a, on a college team. And so you're, you have that ability ability to take any position out of the back row if needed um so transi transitioning to the international level I saw that like everyone can play defense everyone can pass and you know there's a lot of physical ability there too and so um that was probably and and also the speed I mean USA we typically run a very fast offense so that was definitely an adjustment my first week in the gym I was like running like a chicken with its head cut off because I was like this is fast but um it was fun definitely just getting to compete with you know former Olympians and and getting to learn from them and Karch it has been an absolute blast absolutely yeah I think uh it, you can definitely see that from a physical standpoint, you're you're basically playing with the best players in the world, right? And 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 having to adjust your play a little bit, like you probably saw when when you transitioned from high school to a Division mm -hmm. One school in the Big Ten, right? There's there's yes. just like a different type of speed, and then as you get used to that speed over those years, then it kind of slows down for you. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and as you you know you make the national team, um, and in 2018, you know it's known that you. Um, you you end up losing your spot. You struggled a little bit at, at a tournament. Um, and I think that's a lot of questions that came on Instagram when we asked, you know, fans about what questions they had uh, about overcoming adversity. You know, yes. how did, how, what was your mindset when you had the setback? Yeah, I mean, I was pretty bummed and just very disappointed in myself. And just because, you know, I, have always had a starting spot and to lose it was definitely, I mean, no one ever wants to lose their starting spot. And so for me, it was just very kind of devastating because I didn't really know how to react, but you know, at the end of the day, like I am on the national team and there are going to be people that can fill spots. And so I think for me, it was just going back to what I know and, and how, how I've trained all these years and, and just watching a ton of video and whatever that is going to help me improve my game. Because um, for me, it was just 
all in, internal, honestly, like it was no one kind of any external distractions or anything. It was just me and ultimately believing in myself. And so um, after that season had ended, the USA season, um, I stayed in Anaheim and trained with Karch and uh, two of our assistant coaches. And so for a while, it was just me and them um, just basically doing a private lesson every day. And then a few people would come in. I remember Karsta Lowe was in that um, winter and then a couple of people had come in the spring, but for a good, maybe two months, it was just me and them um, just doing a lot of passing, a lot of defense out of system setting. We would probably train for a good hour and a half and then I would lift afterwards. But um, I think that was probably the best for my just my uh, mental stability to to make sure, you know, I was in it and just really searching for what the bigger goal was. And so um, that was definitely a grind, but it was it was motivating. I mean, um, I was just working towards this bigger picture and that's that was earning my spot back. And so um, going into 2019, I felt physically really good I had put in a lot of work with my strength coach during that off season and so physically like I felt better than ever and so I really had to I guess lean on that and so and also all the reps that I had had got with Karch um I had to lean on that because I really had no six on six or live play like every other person on the national team with their club teams and so um I just really, I, I leaned on the reps that I got and just really just went to back, back to technique and fundamentals. And, um, 2019, um, I did not start the first tournament, but I had went to Pan Am cup. And so I went there and, I started to really get back into my groove and my rhythm. It was really hard because, you know, a whole season had passed and I hadn't gone any tournaments um, the whole fall or winter. And so um, I trusted I had to trust a lot of what I did over this over the winter and spring and then also had to trust, you know, my teammates and and had them believe in me and then me believing in myself. And so that Pan Am Cup, we actually won that year. And so um uh, then it transferred over to the World Cup. And actually, I did not start at all that that tournament. Um, and then one game we were playing China and Megan Courtney got taken out um, within the, with the second set. And Karcher's like pointing to me and I was like, oh, shoot, uh, I guess I'm going in. And so um, I was pretty nervous. Um, I remember that match and just remembering like Kelsey or Jordan that was next to me passing. I was like, Hey, like cover my seam until I'm a little bit warm, a little bit more comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. I, we ended up losing that match, but I remember like feeling really good and just like, okay, like I put a little bit of, you know, a deposit into this season and let's just see what comes out of it. Like I really tried to um, seize my opportunity and which I felt like I did. And so, um, after that season had ended, I went overseas to Germany and was in contact with all of the coaches. And, um, that was when Karch had really expressed that, okay, like you, you kind of made a little run for yourself. And, um, if that, were to happen 2020 Tokyo um, that I was actually going to be in contention for it. So that gave me also like a very um, motivating factor and just really, you know, continue to work hard um, when I was overseas. And so um, unfortunately, yeah, 2020 Tokyo did not happen. And so um, it carried over to 2021. And so, yeah, this the same work was put in. I, I've been going overseas. This is my third season. So I think it's definitely helped me with just my confidence and also like being able to play six on six all year round. For sure. For sure. And I, I really love that story of, of you just going back into the gym and really focusing on the things that uh, you can control, even though that there's a, you know, there is uh, pros and cons when it comes to missing a potential full season uh, of, you know, professional ball. I think, uh, you know, just you being able to get back into the gym and, and working on those fundamentals, I'm sure it was really critical for you. Um, mm -hmm. And 
and you didn't go play you didn't go to germany before that or did you um what was your first year in germany 2019 2019 so it was a, it was the year the the following season after um what was it like now playing in germany i mean you know this is the life of a professional athlete in volleyball you know i think uh, yeah. there is no professional indoor league here in the united states and so mm-hmm. um you know what how how has that transition been you know i know it's not easy um but tell us a little bit more about the professional life because you know i know a lot of people aspire to be professional athletes um uh, but the sacrifice that you guys have to make to be able to play at this level um is is something that you know we we don't comprehend but you know what was that transition like now that you were going to germany for the first year yeah i mean it was it was tough um i was on a pretty good team they typically got first or second in the league so there was you know a lot of expectations with with cups and championships and all of that and so that was kind of my first taste of like German volleyball is like very intense and um, they love, you know, their volleyball here in Europe. And so that was also very refreshing because, um, you know, playing for Nebraska was also the same. The The fans were fully invested and it's also here the same in Germany, which is amazing um, because uh, typically, you know, in California, you don't really see that often. And so coming to Germany, it's like super exciting. And hopefully um, this season, we will be able to have fans again. But yeah, my first season was, uh, was tough with just transitioning to living overseas. And, you know, just being in a different country is also just very difficult in itself and going to the grocery store and having to get out your Google Translate to make sure that you're (laughs) buying uh, some of the stuff that you um, kind of get back home. And so um, after, you know, the first month or two, you kind of um, remember like, okay, this is what I'm going to get at the grocery store. And this is how I walk there and all these things. So you kind of uh, get your bearings down. But um, Yeah, I mean, it was fun because we had actually a couple of Americans on that team. And then also like in Germany, typically everyone speaks English. So the coaches were were great and they also spoke English, had great uh, trainings when I was there. And so, um, yeah, I loved it. And I I honestly have loved my experience every time I've played in Germany um, because it's pretty um, westernized and everyone for the most part like even the the citizens here speak English at the grocery store for instance or the restaurants Mm. and so that's awesome it's not like a huge you know culture shock or anything but um yeah other than that like it's been awesome and and in the Bundesliga like every team is typically good like you can kind of upset any team on any given night so um Mm. the yeah the competitiveness is is pretty high here that's awesome. Yeah, it really keeps you on your game to make sure that you guys are playing at the highest level in order to win the league, which is really that, that's the mindset that you need. Right. When it comes to mm-hmm. playing at the international level, for sure. Um, you know, and I think uh, that's awesome. I think that one of the questions that we had was, you know, what is a day in a life uh, for Justine? Uh, you know, like what is it? Tell me a little bit more about your day. Like how, what is your routine like? Uh, you know, when you, from, from the time that you wake up to, to the time that you go to bed, you know, what is the, a day of a professional athlete look like? Yeah. So typically um, in the mornings, we'll either have a ball practice and it's individual um, with like passers going together and middle blockers going together, setters going together, or on the, um, on alternating days, it'll be um, a lift. So tomorrow, for instance, we'll, we actually have a really cool sponsor. So in in Europe, there are a ton of sponsors and that's kind of how clubs um, survive with just like, you know, different things um, helping them throughout the season. So one of our sponsors is actually a, a fitness gym. And so we're able to go there tomorrow and have access to the whole gym. And right now it's pretty empty. Um, so we have, you know, all of these squat racks and dumbbells, like, all these things that you name it. And so um, it's really nice to be able to kind of have a little bit of freedom in that. And our assistant coach gives us our um, weightlifting program. So we follow that each week. And then, so then we'll have that for about hour and a half to two hours. And then um, after that, we 
actually also have um, lunch sponsors. So every day of the week, uh, lunch is provided by the club. So we'll go and get lunch um, at this place that's not too far from the fitness gym and we'll eat lunch there. And then we have a pretty big break, at least for me. Some people have physio, so they'll get treatment on whatever's bothering them or if they have a rehab program that they're following, they'll go and do that. Um, so, but for me, I had physio today. So tomorrow I have a, a good break. So I have probably around four hours until our second practice at um, 6.30. So we'll practice for three hours at the nighttime, in the nighttime. Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's basically like position, potentially every other day you're either doing like position focus mm -hmm. drills. Um, and then, and then you'll, so it's basically double days every day, just depending yep. on, on if it's a, a ball control or, or if it's lifting that, that yep. morning mm -hmm. uh, workout. Cool. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah. and, and now kind of rolling into, you know, Tokyo 2020, even though it happened in 2021, you know, you watching you guys, you guys were rolling through pool play for some time. Um, and then you guys, uh, started, then you guys played uh, the Russian Olympic Committee uh, during mm -hmm. pool. And I know it was a pretty tough loss for your team. You know, what was the conversation like uh, as a team after that loss? Um, you know, because you guys had to bounce back pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, what was that like? How, how did you guys kind of come together? And, and what, what was that conversation uh, with each other like? And, and what were some areas that you guys thought that you guys could improve moving forward? Yeah, so we... We the the structure of the of the games was fit pretty nicely because we played every other day. So we always mm. had that day to kind of debrief whatever we um, did well or whatever we could improve upon. And so obviously against the Russia match, we were all pretty stunned, I would say. I mean, Russia mm -hmm. came out hot and they probably played one of their best matches. I mean, they were on fire that I feel like they didn't make any errors that match. And, and so a lot of it was just giving credit to them. I mean, they played a great match. Obviously we didn't play as good as we wanted to. Um, and so we had our sports consultant coach Sue Enquist that was um, newly hired to our team in 2020. And so she's been a big part of our success and just our program and um, the, the things that we've worked on as a, as a staff and also with the players. And so we kind of discussed with her, like, Hey, like, is there any like adjustments that we needed? And mainly it, it wasn't anything, I guess, emotionally or um, anything like, mentally I felt like we were all pretty engaged and um no one was like not giving any energy or anything like that it was mainly just tactically and so we had brought up as a team like okay we need to be doing more things in practice um that could better I guess um kind of prepare us for the next matches so we had brought up to the coaching staff like hey um in practice can we see more of the attackers, like what their tendencies are and things like that. So we can kind of already have in mind, like, okay, in the game, maybe they're going to do this and we're going to block this, or we're going to defend them like this. And so, um, because as a team, we, we watch a video, but I think for people on the court, it was better, you know, to see it visually and, and more, um, on the court at hand. And so um, that's kind of one switch that we made, I guess, as a, as a uh, tactic wise. And so um, moving forward, you know, we did that against Italy and then we did that against um, all the rest of the teams, Dominican, Serbia, and then again, Brazil. So um, I like that fix that we had made and, and, you know, it was the Olympics, so we didn't want to lose again. So we made that and we voiced that to the coaches like, Hey, this is what we need as a team. And they, you know, did everything that would um, fulfill our wishes. And so I feel like that was also a great leap of us and trusting, you know, the staff and the players alike. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I know we kind of jumped right into like the Tokyo Olympics and, and a certain match, but uh, maybe taking a quick step back, you know, what was that experience like, you know, making the national, uh, making the Olympic team, you know, they only take 12, right. And, and 
what was that like for you? Um, I'm sure it was a dream come true, but when, when Karch Karai says, Justine, I'm so happy to, to let you know that you've made the national, you've made the Olympic team, you know, what was that feeling like? What was that experience like? Oh my gosh. It was just a roller coaster of emotions, mainly because we were actually in our VNL tournament at the time when he had mm. announced the roster. And so obviously everyone's, you know, feeling some sort of anxiety and there's also excitement and also potentially, you know, sadness because um, we took 18 to that tournament and only 12 made it. And so mm. we had, um, we had an option to either meet with him in person or we could find out at the very end of that kind of time frame to get the full um, email, uh, the full roster emailed. And so a lot of us actually, maybe all but two wanted to meet in person. And so we had a two hour time frame where we would have 10 minute meetings. And so um, everyone kind of went down the list. I think I was fourth. I was like, okay, I just want to get it over with. Whether it's a yes or no, I'm going in there. And so we had gone into the room and, and at this point, like everyone could not talk to any of the teammates because we couldn't say like, if we made it or not, just because, you know, some of them didn't, hadn't gone yet to their meeting. And so um, when I went into my meeting, I was honestly just thinking it was going to be Karch and I. And so I walked into the room and it's like the entire staff. And so at that point, I'm already like kind of taken off guard because I'm like, okay, I guess everyone's going to be in the meeting. And so he sits us down and then um, he's like kind of goes through your your um, journey with the national team. And so with me, you know, I had obviously some struggles, lost my spot in 2018. And so he had uh, mentioned that and just was like, hey, like you've had a lot of uh, obstacles in your way, but um, ultimately like you overcame it. And it was just a matter of like when you were going to believe in yourself and you have. And then he was like, you know, thankfully like you did because congratulations you're going to be an olympian and i just started crying i was like oh my gosh this is crazy um and gave everyone a hug and um uh, went to my room and then as soon as i went to my room i called my mom and i was just like oh my gosh i'm like <laughs> in shock uh and um it was just it was also like very kind of mixed emotions because then the next day a lot of people that hadn't made it, we had to see them. Um, we were still in a tournament, so we actually had to practice the next day. Um, mm. So it was it was a little bit of a bummer. I mean, everyone who made it, obviously very, very excited for them. But at the same time, like people, six people got their dreams crushed. And so we kind of had to give them grace and whatever they needed. I, and we had the best group. Like from that point on, I knew we were going to be so successful in Tokyo because the six girls that didn't make the roster, they were so supportive. I mean, anything and everything we asked for, they were so supportive and willing, like wholeheartedly in it for us. And so um, mm. going into Tokyo, we were probably just the closest we've ever been. Yeah, you're locked in and, and you can def it definitely showed, you know, when you guys first played a couple of matches, it was, yeah, you're going to run through, you know, an obstacle during pool play, but that that shouldn't deter you. And it, and it really, you know, we, we look back on things in our life and, and especially certain situations of like, Hey, that loss actually helped us kind of prepare mm -hmm. even more, you know, for, for our yeah. future matches that, that helped us bring, bring us to the gold medal, you know? And I think like taking a step back and realizing certain parts in your journey, whether it's losing your spot and, and knowing that you put in the work and, and you just believed in yourself and, and, getting that call to become an Olympian. It just, it just shows like, if you believe in yourself, you're going to have to face obstacles uh, like the way that you guys have um, you'll see, you will see success what, in, in different ways and different aspects, but it's really impressive to see, you know, your success and how you got there. You know, I think that that's really what's important about doing these types of interviews is that there's no linear, linear line to success. You know, there's always going to be, you know, ups and right. downs and 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 it's really about how do you come up from a down right and i think mm -hmm. that's 
that's really interesting. And that's what some of our fans want to, or some of your fans want to hear when it comes to facing adversity. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, and so you win the gold, uh, you know, <laughs> you tell me, okay. So, I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you guys are going nuts on the court and, and it's, it's a great experience. Um, what, what was that process like, you know, now that you've won gold, um, you're going to like, did you, do you go home and then get changed and go get the gold medal? Like, tell me, tell me the journey. Cause you know, at the end of the day, we just see you guys standing on the podium with your with getting medals, but like, what, what was that journey? Like, okay, you win the gold medal match against Brazil. Uh, now what? Walk yeah, I, I've been everywhere. I mean, I've been trying to see as many people and just, um, celebrate with as many people as I can. I mean, there's been so many people a part of my journey that I definitely, you know, want to pay it forward and give it back to them because I feel like so many people have been a little piece of this journey. And so to celebrate with them is just what, you know, I think uh, is deserving of of them and for me. And so um, as soon as we got back, so um, it's funny because after we won the gold medal match, three girls actually had got randomly drug tested. So we had to wait for them in the locker room. Um, well, it was a choice. Our team leader was like, okay, either we go without them and just kind of chill at the village or we just wait for them here um, and just, you know, celebrate, do whatever. We had like champagne and all of these things. And so we're like, yeah, we, we have nowhere to be. Let's just chill out here. And so um, we hung out in the locker room, you know, we we're listening to music, kind of just getting rowdy. And then um, finally, all three of them, you know, successfully um, got drug tested. And then we went back to the village and at this point it had been, it had passed four hours. So we had like maybe 15 minutes to put on our closing ceremony outfits and then go to the buses. And so we like <laughs> jammed out of there and we were literally like still sweaty from um, the match. So all of us just like put up our hair, just threw on the clothes or like whatever. And so we went there, had a lot of fun at the closing ceremonies and just, I mean, we all wore our medals and it was just so awesome to be a part of it. And then um, as soon as we actually got back to the village and, the next day we were out. Um, we had mm. a pretty early uh, departure. And so we got out of there and then touched down um, in LA. And then we had, we had planned, you know, no matter the outcome, we wanted to celebrate as a, as a team of 23. We, we have this hashtag 23 strong, because that's how many people were in that gym um, before the games. And, you know, everyone had a piece of it and everyone contributed to this gold medal. And so we really wanted to celebrate that. Um, so we went out to Santa Monica and Kelsey Robinson put together this really nice dinner for us and organized this whole event. And so we were there from, from like 6 to 10 p.m. in Santa Monica and everyone just, you know, everyone had a plus one. So um, my boyfriend, Andrew, came and everyone's, you know, spouses came. And so it was really like a nice um, night just to like see each other off the court but also you know kind of reminisce and and just be together um, off the court and just celebrate and so that was on Tuesday night the next day Andrew and I went to Dallas and we spent some time with his family there and then after that I went to Nebraska and they did something for me there and just honored me at a match and so that was pretty cool to see all of my former coaches and some of my teammates that are still there, my friends. And then after that came home, kind of relaxed and celebrated with my family, um, had a few weddings to go to. And then uh, September 14th is when I left for Germany. So it's been a really busy, busy six weeks, but <laughs> it was so, so worth it. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And I, I can imagine that everyone wants to see you uh, <laughs> and, and, and also see the, the gold medal that probably, you know, very, very rare people get to see in their lifetime. I'm excited to see it when I see you too. Yes. Um, but I think it's a, it's a well-deserved uh, medal. Um, you know, I think that you, you've, I, I mean, I'm just like a proud, uh, 
proud friend. You know, I've known you for a really long time. So like almost like a proud big brother in terms of just seeing your success. And I'm excited for what's next for you. You know, I think it's like, I think this is just the start of where your career is going to go. You know, what, what is the next dream for you? I mean, I think, you know, you've, you've achieved the top of the top when it comes to being the best libero in the world. Um, it's kind of crazy to say that, but it's, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's, it's amazing and you it's well-deserved, you know, I think that you played out of your mind and, it, and you could just see that you were, you were balling out and, uh, you know, but what, what is the next dream? You know, what, what are some of the goals that you have next now that you've accomplished all these different things? Yeah. I mean, Paris 2024 is not too far away. So, um, I think that would be amazing, especially, and hopefully if, um, this pandemic kind of cools down and, um, they're allowed spectators, of course, you know, my mom is going to be that first flight out to Paris. And so, um, I would love to have my family and friends, whoever is willing to go to Paris. Um, I would love to have them in the stands cheering for me. Cause that was probably the one thing that I, you know, we all kind of missed out on, especially the girls that, have been to, you know, prior Olympics, they won the gold this year and, and their families were not able to be there. So I kind of want that experience for me to, to have them there, but also for them to experience an Olympics. So, um, Mm. Paris 2024 is definitely on my radar. Absolutely. I I mean, I'm excited. I'm excited for that. Um, yeah, I think, I think I know your mom and I know that she would be the first one out there for sure. (laughs) If they allow, if they allow fans and, uh, um, and we do have some, you know, just general questions for you. Um, you know, first being, you know, how do you define success for yourself? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it just all comes from within and, what I've been kind of preaching this whole interview is just that belief in myself. It took me a long time to find it, but as soon as I did, it kind of just, you know, let me blossom into that person and also that player that I am today. And I think, um, you know, that can only come from within yourself. And as long as you kind of find that, however, um, however you find it, um, I think you're going to find success um, in the long run. And obviously, you know, you have to be motivated and driven in order to attain that, you know, that big goal of yours, whatever that is. And so, um, yeah, I mean, as soon as you're, you find your passion, go for it. I love it. I love it. And if there was one piece of advice that you could give to yourself, if you were to, if you were able to go 10 years back, what, what piece of advice would you give to yourself? Mm, I think I would probably say, to go to, as soon as I graduated from Nebraska, to go to play overseas my first year. I think knowing now how instrumental it it was and it is for my career, I would have said, you know, go hop, get on that opportunity and just go and play wherever you can because um, overseas life, you just really find out a lot about yourself. Um, you kind of grow in that space. Um, you're you're pretty much alone for a lot of majority of the time. And you just figure out, you know, a lot of things about yourself, whether it be personally or even on the court. And so um, Mm -hmm. I'm super thankful for, you know, overseas life and just the opportunities that I've, I've had so far. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then we do have some rapid fire questions as well as questions from Instagram. Um, but essentially, uh, some questions that we got were, what are the top three tips that you give liberos who are trying to improve their game today? Mm, I would say um, do a lot of passing reps. Serve receiver reps are always good. Um, and whether that's, you know, as an outside hitter or libero, whoever, whatever position you are, honestly, I would say passing is always key. And if you can pass, you will definitely be on the court. So um, that's a huge, you know, no matter what level you're at, if you can pass, like you're going to be pretty successful as a team. So that's definitely one Um, defense. I would say, um, you know, play a lot of beach volleyball. That's definitely going to help you in your reading game Um, and just kind of, your court awareness and your just reading abilities, um, especially because there's only two of you out on the court. So that definitely will kind of uh, just broaden your range once you go back onto the hard court. 
And then I guess I would say also setting, I mean, out of system setting is a huge part of being a libero and taking that uh, second contact when the, when the setter's digging. So make sure to focus on that and always being able to um, not only underhand set, but I would even say overhand set. I know some people kind of have their preferences, but it's always good to, to learn both. Yeah, definitely. Definitely good skill sets to, to work on um, at the libero position. Um, another question that we had was what inspires slash motivates you every day? I think just being, I know this kind of really sounds cliche, but being the best version of myself, um, mm -hmm. I am so, so thankful for my sport and just being able to, you know, create these relationships that I get, um, whether it's overseas or even on the national team. I mean, these are some pretty great relationships to keep and hopefully, you know, last a very long time. And so for me, like just being who I am and just, you know, just finding a lot of um, different people to surround myself that are also good for me. Definitely. Um, another question was favorite position in volleyball besides the barrel. I have a feeling what that is, but I'll let you answer. Yeah, I definitely <laughs> miss my setting days. <laughs> I'm always taking any time it's around my zone. I'm like, all right, I'll set it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how was that? Because I know like you go from like touching the first ball to, or like basically touching every second ball. Right. And like, mm -hmm. as a libero, was there in the beginning where you always like faking out your set or you're like, Oh crap, that's not mine. Oh crap. That's not mine. I know. Um, <laughs> I would always take from Poulter. Jordan Poulter is, Oh my gosh. She is so strong and just can set the ball from anywhere and still keep the speed. And I'm like, all right, I got it. And she just comes in flying and I'm like, Oh shoot. Okay. never mind. She's got it. <laughs> um another one was you know who was your favorite player to watch growing up and was that some like was that someone that you emulated your game one person was misty may i know she didn't play she was more i guess notorious for beach volleyball but i just love the way she played and how she competed because i mean she was kind of like an undersized player but she didn't play like that at all i mean she was so physical and just her mindset and her ability to win and take over matches. And so that's kind of someone that I aspired to meet. And also with Sarah Hughes and I playing beach volleyball, we always kind of joked and said like, Hey, like I missed you, you're Carrie. And we kind of emulated our game after, after them too. And so that definitely drove us to, you know, really go far into the sport and, and just really inspired us to, to keep playing. For sure, for sure. Yeah, Misty May and uh, Carrie Walsh uh, Jennings, it, well, they were so fun to watch, and you know, obviously mm -hmm. the success on in the on the Olympic level uh, to see, and and definitely good people to to uh, look up to, and, and yes. some of the goals that they've achieved. Um, and the very last question we had was, um, you know, do you feel proud being uh, representing Asian athletes? Um, and motivating Asian girls to play, you know, professional sports. I mean, um, you know, in this day and age, you know, you don't see many Asian professional athletes in the United States. Um, and, and you being, uh, you know, who you are and the success that you've found, you're definitely someone that people look up to. But, you know, how does it feel to represent the Asian community in that perspective? Yeah, I mean, I am so, you know, proud for for where I come from and just also being able to inspire people and whoever that may be and whatever their passion may be. I think that has definitely like over the years um, in my career, that's, that's taught me a lot. I just keep going for that, for that passion and just whoever is willing to share that passion, like gravitate towards them. And so I think that is a huge thing, you know, just in life, just whatever you're passionate about, you, you go for it and, and don't, you know, it shouldn't matter what people think about you or, or what other people say, like, you cannot do this, you can't do this, whatever, but, um, you know, just go for it. And I think, especially, you know, what's going on in the world right now, I think it's, it's a huge thing for all of these Asian Americans in the, in the Tokyo Olympics, um, to really just inspire and give back to, to their communities. And so I hope, you know, that I am doing that and I'm a part of that, just a little piece of that because, um, yeah, this, 
this generation, hopefully, um, you know, we, we have to use our voice. And so hopefully I can do that. Absolutely. And I think you are definitely, um, you know, a proud, I think a lot of Asians are very proud, you know, to see the level of success that you've achieved and, and, you know, what, just to know that, you know, we're here, right. And, and we're, we're, we're ready to make some noise. And like you said, find our voice. And I think, you know, you're, you're doing that on your platform. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we, we definitely uh, will continue to be inspired by your success and just your journey in general. Right. I think it's, it's very, it's, it's a, it's an amazing journey and um, I'm excited to share it with our community. Um, and if there's any, are there any last things that you want to say to, you know, all your fans or people out there that are watching this interview? Um, feel free to. I mean, I, I, I just want to thank everyone um, for the support. And I know, you know, I may not physically be able to say that, but I, I know like a lot of people are supporting um, wherever they are. And so I just want to say a big thank you. And um, for watching women's volleyball, I, I really hope that um, by us kind of really putting our hard work and leaving it out on the court in Tokyo, I hope that kind of puts women's volleyball on the map in the United States, because mm -hmm. I think we definitely need to grow the sport in the U.S. and hopefully really um, grow a league out there. For sure. For sure. I mean, I would love to have a league out here and, and watch <laughs> high competitive volleyball. I'm sad that we don't have that here. I mean, um, I'm a volleyball fan as well as a player. So, you know, selfishly, I would love to see that the sport continue to grow and, you know, and you have, and here you have it, you know, the best libero in the world wanting to push for this um, as well as, um, you know, in being the first team, uh, being the first national team to ever win gold, you know, you've made history and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, congratulations. Um, obviously, you know, we're excited to see more success, um, but we really appreciate you taking the time um, to, to sit down and chat with us and, and share a little bit beyond what we see on TV. Um, and so we appreciate you taking the time. Of course. Awesome. Well, there you have it. Best libero in the world, Justine Wong Arantes. Um, thank you for tuning in and we will definitely see you soon. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed the interview, make sure to click the subscribe button and follow us on our social media.